you hear me? Can you hear me now? So first I'd like to join everybody else in thanking the organizers for, for putting together such a wonderful conference. But I'm not going to thank them for inviting me to give this talk here. <laughs> and the reason is that I'm actually not quite sure what I'm expected to do here. I was asked to give a vision talk on quantum field theory, but what is a vision talk? Is it a summary of where we are? Or is it a vision for the next few years, like what we write in a grant proposal? Or is it a vision for the next decade? Or perhaps for the next century, which will make sure that the vision is completely wrong? So I asked David, and he said, you should do all of these. <laughs> so I'm going to share with you some thoughts about quantum field theory. And these thoughts were influenced by many discussions with Ed Witten and I'm going to thank him for sharing his insight, but this does not mean that he necessarily agrees with everything I'm going to say. So this is the qualification. So quantum field theory. So I view quantum field theory as the language of physics. This is, it appears everywhere, and I think we should really think of it as a language rather than a topic for that describes particular phenomena because it appears in particle physics, where it's clearly the language used to describe the, the standard model of particle physics, with spectacular, unprecedented success. This is the accuracy of the theoretical prediction of the, electric dipole, the electron dipole moment, spectacular agreement between theory and experiment. It also appears in condensed matter physics, where it describes the long distance properties of materials, the phases materials can have and the phase transitions between them. It appears in cosmology, we heard a little bit about it in this conference. We heard more in this conference how it appears in string theory or quantum gravity. And it appears basically in three categories, either as the quantum field theory in two dimensions on the string wall sheet, or as this low energy space time approximation for string theory, or even the description of the whole theory in the context of gauge gravity duality. And it also has applications in mathematics. So this is a very rich subject, and I like to think about it as the modern calculus. This is the thing that replaces calculus that was invented for one thing, but it has all sorts of many other implications and applications. And it's the natural language for describing many diverse phenomena. Over the last several decades, we have seen enormous progress some people think, when I remember when I was a graduate student, people said quantum field theory is a dead field. There's nothing to discover. Today it looks ridiculous. And my first prediction that I'm going to make this talk, there will be other predictions later, is that the progress will continue and we'll see many more phenomena in the future. And this will be exciting. So about eight years ago, almost eight years ago, not very far from here, the 2011 Solvay conference took place, not surprisingly organized by the same people, Mark and David. And just as today, I was asked to make some comments on quantum field theory. The difference is that I was assigned five minutes, and the cons another constraint, so not more than five minutes, and the other constraint was only one slide. So I thought it would be nice to start this talk by showing that slide from eight years ago. And this is the slide I presented. I raised the question, should quantum field theory be reformulated? And I should say from the outset that this is not to mean that the current understanding of quantum field theory is wrong. It's not wrong, it's correct. I do believe that it is incomplete and there must be deeper underlying structure which would be more insightful. And then about eight years ago, I started by saying that there was kind of the first thing was common about Lagrangians. I said that there are examples with no semi-classical limit and there's no Lagrangian. There are examples with several semi-classical limits. That's in duality. Uh, the most exact solutions of quantum field theories do not depend on having an underlying Lagrangian. The Lagrangian is not even mentioned and we'll hear about it probably later in this vision session. 
and there's magic in amplitude that's go, that goes beyond Feynman diagrams. The second argue point was that it's not mathematically rigorous, and I emphasize that this should not be viewed as the mathematicians have a problem not understanding us, but this is our problem that we do not manage to explain to them what we are doing, and I think it reflects on the fact that we don't fully understand it. And finally, I mentioned then there are extensions of various traditional local quantum field theory, like theories on non-commutative spaces, little string theory, and so forth. I find it interesting that I gave this slide, presented this slide eight years ago, and it's as relevant today as it was then. This is both good and bad. Good that hasn't, nothing is wrong here. Bad that eight years have passed and there hasn't been any progress. And maybe this should be a warning sign for you for the rest of this talk. It will also give kind of a vision for the future and it might not be in the right direction. So in planning this talk, I saw several different routes. My first reaction was that I should make a long list of issues in quantum field theory, summarize where we are, outline or stress the open question, and maybe speculate about the way forward. Instead, I thought that this is not a good idea. This would be like a long laundry list of issues. And I thought I would focus only on one particular topic and talk about that, and that might not be the most relevant one or the most interesting one, but this is a topic that I think is worth thinking about. And this is the question of how to organize quantum field theories. How, uh, we should start some organization in this zoo of phenomena that we know about. So uh, this is something I've been thinking about for a long time with various collaborators. And as a possible path forward, I thought it would be nice and interesting to see how our friends, the condensed matter physicists, think about quantum field theory. And to my huge surprise, I realized that they are thinking about it a little bit differently than we do. And in fact, this has caused a lot of confusion because what they mean is not exactly what we mean. And many of these differences stem from the fact that their starting point is a real lattice. There is a real lattice and they consider systems on the lattice and then they ask, what do we find at long distances? So in order to, do the, to explain the difference between the two views, I should explain one and then the other. So let me start with high energy physics. So the high energy physics view is that we start at high energy lambda with some scale invariant theory, for example, a free theory described by a Lagrangian, and then we deform it by a finite set of relevant operators or maybe a finite set of exactly marginal operators. And I think the key point on this slide is the word finite here and the word finite here. We also allow an infinite set of infinitesimal deformations of irrelevant operators, but they are infinitesimal. So this is how I, for example, was learned to, to think about quantum field theory. It's a family of theories labeled by these parameters. And we ask, what does it do at long distances? What's the outcome of the theory? What does it give? Let's compare that with the way it's thought about in condensed matter physics. They also start at high energies or short distances with a lattice, lambda, and they put some spins on the lattice or some degrees of freedom at short distances. And they allow an arbitrary number of degrees of freedom at the lattice scale. So the space of parameter is infinitely bigger than in the definition of the theory, the way high energy physicists think about that. They do, just like us, impose some global symmetries or maybe some selection rules like no spinners and others. And then they study the system as a function of all these parameters. So they study the system in a much, much larger parameter space of theories. Let me present that more pictorially. In condensed matter physics, we start at short distances with some lattice system, Hamiltonian or Lagrangian, and allow all possible couplings and an infinite set of an infinite dimensional space that is being explored. And then we explore what we find at long distances. This is to be contrasted with the high energy view where we start at high energy by a scale invariant of conti continuum field theory deformed by, again, I underscore finite number of relevant operators. And then we again ask, what do we find at long distances? So we have here a much smaller set of coupling constants, a more limited outcome, 
But it's also more concrete because we say in this particular subspace, we land in this phase rather than in another phase. In order to highlight the relation between the two views, I'd like to phrase the, the lattice version in continuum statement. How should we think of it in the continuum language? So we can think of the condensed matter or the lattice view in the following way. We still have the UV cutoff lambda, and we have low energy physics at the scale little m, but at the scale big m, much less than the UV cutoff lambda, and much higher than the low energy scale m, we can allow arbitrary number of new degrees of freedom. We can throw in arbitrary number of degrees of freedom with arbitrary coupling constants for them. So this is where we introduce an infinite number of coupling constants and a lot of freedom, again, subject to the global symmetry, selection rules, and so forth. And the nice thing is that when we do that, we don't really change the outcome. The infrared behavior is the same because we only modify the theory at high energy by some extra degrees of freedom there. But now comes the power of this new view. We can change the parameters in this large parameter space and move elsewhere in phase space and find all sorts of new phases that the original theory does not give us. So what we have here is a much larger space of theories that can exhibit new phases. So the first thing we'd like to do is I'd like to give, propose a name for this much larger class of theories. So we take our continuum quantum field theory, the way high energy physicists think about it, with a finite number of parameters, and we embed it in a much bigger space that I'm going to refer to as the deformation class of the quantum field theory. So quantum field theories will be put, not just labeled by the Lagrangian and the parameters, but we're going to put them in much bigger boxes, which include anything we can get from one theory to another by adding degrees of freedom, varying the parameters, and exploring this large, big space. How do we see it in practice? So let's look at, the, for example, the issue of duality. In high energy physics, the view of duality is two theories at short distances, lambda, that lead to the same physics either at all length scale or only in the infrared or only at low energies. In the condensed matter literature, these are two theories connected by this large space of deformations. So these are two different lattice systems that we can have a path between them, perhaps with phase transitions, doesn't have to be continuous, but there's a continuous path in the parameter space that allows us to connect the two different theories. This is a much different notion of duality than in high energy physics. And indeed, it's often stated there that duality is the statement that these are two theories that live in the same Hilbert space. Honestly, I don't quite understand what this sentence means, but you often hear it in the condensed matter. But this thing, I think, really highlights the di difference between the two different views on quantum field theory. I would like now to switch gears and talk about a different topic, and then I'll connect the two issues together. And the different topic is the issue of global symmetries and the Tooft anomalies. So we have heard many times in this conference and elsewhere that gauge symmetries are not intrinsic to the system, but global symmetries are intrinsic properties of a quantum field theory, and therefore they should be studied. They are real properties of the system. And as they exist, it makes sense, it's natural and extremely useful to couple them to background gauge fields. And then the phenomenon of a Tooft anomalies arise. It's the statement that the partition function or correlation function as a function or function out of this background gauge field is not gauge invariant. And there are various ways of stating it. Uh, one simple way is that it's not gauge invariant as it stands, but we can extend the theory to a one higher dimensional bulk, specify the gauge fields there, and then it becomes gauge invariant. So I should emphasize that this does not mean that the theory is inconsistent. This anomaly does not mean there's nothing wrong with the theory. The theory is perfectly sensible, it's just that if we try to couple it to background fields, as it stands, we can almost do that. It's not quite gauge invariant. Or we need to modify the theory, either by attaching a bulk or adding more degrees of freedom. So an example that we'll come to later is the standard model of particle physics without neutrino masses, just a straightforward uh, standard model. And it has a V1 global symmetry, V minus L. This is an exact symmetry of the standard model. And it has an Etoft anomaly. And therefore, B minus L cannot be gauged unless we add a right-handed neutrino or we add a bulk. Let's see how to think about it from the other perspective of condensed matter physics or the lattice. So 
So if we start in a lattice with a lattice and it has some global symmetry, in most cases, the, these global symmetries do not have a tooth anomalies. Just have some spins on the lattice and you rotate them, there's not going to be any anomaly. There are two notable exceptions. One is when the global symmetry is not an exact symmetry of the system, but arises as an approximate symmetry at low energies. And the second notable exception is that when the global symmetry does not act and put the technical phrases on site, and the prime example is shifting the lattice by one lattice spacing, by one unit, that symmetry could be part of translation symmetry in the continuum limit, or it might appear as a Z2 gauge or a ZN gauge symmetry, global symmetry at long distances, and then it can have anomalies. In the continuum version that I presented earlier, adding these degrees of freedom at energies big M, so that's how we modify. We start from one funnel field theory and we add degrees of freedom at energy big M, much below the cutoff, that does not change the Atuft anomaly because we don't change the infrared behavior, we don't change the massless particle, all we do is add massive particles. So that's not going to change the anomaly. And we get from this already one result that all the theories in this large deformation class that I defined earlier, defined by adding these extra degrees of freedom at the scale big M and varying all these parameters, this whole class of theories must have the same symmetries. Well, that's by construction. But the second part is more interesting. They have the same anomalies. So this is one thing that is true, that we can move in this path, big space, and all the anomalies match. And that's quite significant because this is true even for anomalies we are not yet aware of. There might be all sorts of new, mathematically more sophisticated anomalies. First anomalies that I'm not aware of, but the experts are. But there might also be other anomalies that even the experts are not yet aware of. And this guarantees, this argument guarantees that all the theories in the same deformation class have the same Tooft anomalies. So let me talk a little bit about two theories with the same symmetries and the same Tooft anomalies. They might or might not be in the same deformation class. So somebody hands you two theories with the same global symmetry and the same Tooft anomalies. So the first thing we can say about them is that such theories are candidate theories to be dual to each other. For example, they can both start, we can start from both of them, with either of them at short distances, and flow at long distances to some infrared behavior. And since the global symmetries and the anomalies here are the same, they have a chance of hitting the same infrared point. There's no guarantee that they would do that, but this is a candidate theory that we can explore. This is a candidate thing that we can explore. The alternative is, again, if we have two theories that flow, that have the same anomalies, one of them might be the infrared behavior of the other. So this is one application of a, these two theories with the same global symmetries and the same Tooft anomalies. I'd like to present now several examples of theories in the same deformation class and use that to extract lessons. And there are many, many different examples and I wasted a lot of time thinking how, which example I should choose, which one I should focus on. So I decided to choose three and I might even have enough time to present all three. So I present three theories exhibiting different points. Some of the details might be slightly too technical, but the examples are kind of distinct, and I think every one of you will have at least one example they can relate to because they touch different kinds of physics. So the first example is a theory that was very interesting in the late 80s. In fact, this is a version of grand unified theories. So we start in four dimensions with an SU5 gauge theory with fermions in five bar and 10. So this is the same as the grand unified theory, except that it has only one generation of fermions and there are no Higgs fields. So this theory is strongly coupled. It's very hard to simulate because it's chiral. And the question is, what does it do? Well, the honest answer is that we don't know. There are various speculations, and I'll derive that, but I'll mention one of them, but we don't know. But let's use this idea of a deformation class to explore it. So I'm going to add to this system a scalar field in the five of SU5. It's a massive scalar field. It doesn't change anything. So this system has a B minus L global symmetry, the same B minus L global symmetry that I talked about earlier. So we have a scalar, we add a scalar field in the five, 
in a Yukawa coupling to 210, and so far nothing has changed. So you only change the theory a little bit at high energies, it doesn't matter for solving the systems. But now we have many more parameters in the potential of the scalar field, so we change the potential of the scalar field. The scalar field condenses, and when it condenses, it can Higgs SU5 to say SU4, and give masses to some of the fermions. Whoops, what did I do? And give masses to some of the fermions. So we are left with SU4, gauge symmetry, and fermions in one plus four plus four bar. Don't worry about the details. Now the SU4 dynamics kicks in. So this is SU4 with one flavor. And we are left at low energies with a single massless fermion, call it chi. And it has the quantum numbers of a product of three microscopic fermions. So what do we learn from that? We learn that the this theory of a single massless fermion has the same global symmetry and the same anomalies as the microscopic theory. And therefore, it might be the infrared behavior of this theory. And in fact, this is what these people suggested using a closely related line of reasoning without thinking about it as by a theory in the deformation class of this theory. It's, it's, it's al they almost said that, so they should be given full credit. So this is one example. As a second example, I'd like to discuss two-dimensional field theory. And this is the E8 times E8, or the spin 32 mod Z2 chiral, fermion, chi uh, chiral theories, left-moving fermion. And we can ask ourselves, can we deform one theory to the other? So the answer is obviously no. They don't even have the same global symmetries. One of them is E8 times E8, and the other has spin 32 mod Z2. However, if we are willing to, to contemplate smaller symmetries, maybe we can deform one to the other. And that might look strange. How can we deform this theory with E8 times E8 fermions, it could, or global chiral algebra, or maybe we can think of it in terms of chiral fermions. How can we continuously change the way we sum of the spin structures of the fermions? So we can't do that in the traditional view of quantum field theory, but we can do that in this larger space of the deformation class. So we, we need to break the symmetry, as I said. So let's start with one of them, say the E8 times E8. I'm going to add a massive scalar field, left and right moving scalar field, with a potential, say cosine phi. That does not change the long distance behavior. The long distance behavior is exactly the same as before. It's E8 times E8, as we started. Now, we change the parameters. We remove the, co the potential, we bring the potential to zero. At that point, there is a phase transition, but that's within our rules. We are allowed to cross phase transitions. And we have a theory with 17 plus one compact bosons. And we have the formal lattice, we can rotate the lattice, then we can turn on the potential again in another direction. And by doing that, we end up with the other theory. So this way we manage to interpolate from one theory to the other, thus establishing that they are in the same deformation class. I don't have a lot of time. This is not consistent with my clock. So I'll just rush quickly through a recent paper that I really like by these three people. They wanted to study the anomaly of Maxwell theory. And the anomaly is, so I'll rush quickly, but the slides will be online, so if, if you want more details, you can read there. They started with a six-dimensional E string. It has two branches, a Coulomb branch and a tensor branch. And there are some various fields on these branches, but the theory is essentially free on these branches. And they conclude from that that the gravitational anomaly of the tensor gauge field is the same as the, as the gravitational anomaly of 28 six-dimensional fermions. This is nice because we use the existence of this E string theory to tell us something about the anomaly of two free theories. And here we see this embedding in a bigger structure where this bigger structure is not a free, is not, sorry, is not a free field theory, but instead it's an interacting field theory. So that's what they did. So they showed that the tensor field and these fermions are in the same deformation class. And then they went on and took this sentence or this statement and compactified it to four dimensions to relate a single photon in four dimensions to 56 4 d vile fermions. And that follows without doing a single anomaly computation and it addresses all sorts of anomalies that are way above my pay grade. 
And that talks about the SO2Z and the mixed anomaly between SO2Z and gravity. I'm approaching the end of my time, so I'm going to raise a question. Can we go the other way? So I said that if we have two theories in the same deformation class, they necessarily have the same anomalies. So they have the same anomalies, and that could be a useful tool in finding, exploring the anomalies of these theories. So we can ask whether the converse statement is also true. So given two theories in the same space-time dimensions, with the same global symmetries, say selection rules, with the same etouffed anomalies, we can ask, can we always add degrees of freedom at short distances such that you can interpolate from one to the other? Interpolation might go for phase transitions, but are they in the same deformation class? So we were asked to make conjectures, so I'm going to conjecture that the answer suitably interpreted is yes. This would mean that the deformation class is really the deformation, definition of all the theories with the, is defined by the symmetries in the Atuft anomaly. So this whole thing of adding degrees of freedom and changing the parameters and using strong coupling and this and that, this is equal to saying that the Atuft anomalies are the same. And you can take either one of these two definitions as your starting point. So we're going to conjecture that the space of all theories with the same symmetries and Atuft anomalies is in fact a connected space. And I'd like to mention some warning signs that I'm having difficulties checking it with supersymmetry. There are two examples with supersymmetry that makes me a little bit worried about the statement. One is about some shortening anomaly and the other is a recent interesting paper that might be a counterexample. But once we establish that the space is connected, we can also ask questions about topology of that space. Is it simply connected? And here, there's an interesting anomaly that was discussed. Anomaly is associated with the fact that the parameter space is not simply connected. So this is my conjecture and with the, some warning signs and qualifications. So final words. We discussed the questions of how to organize quantum field theories. I think this is an interesting question that has an answer and you ought to understand it. And one organizing principle is the global symmetries and the Atuft anomalies. And we presented two ways of thinking about it. One, with them as thinking of techniques to find different theories with the same Atuft anomalies. And that is by embedding them in a larger class of theories and moving this larger class. And you raise the question, whether the, this really gives us a complete characterization of this deformation class. More generally, so that was a specific topic that I picked, more generally I want to go back to the beginning and emphasize that I think quantum field theory is the language of physics. It's worth exploring in its own right because of its many applications. It continues to surprise us with new phenomena, new connections between distinct problems, new insights, etc. I have no doubt that it will continue to do that. I have no doubt that it will continue to teach us new things and will have new applications. And therefore, we should definitely continue to explore it. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we have some questions that were submitted anonymously online. None of them directly addressed your talk because it was so original. Um, so we'll open up, we'll allow questions to the audience, think carefully, but I'm going to present some questions which have little to do with your talk except the title. <laughs> um, from the community. So you talked about dualities among the rest, and of course you're famous for dualities. Question is, why is it why are there so many dualities in quantum field theories? Um, what is the essence of these dualities and why do we find them all over the place? Ah, interesting question. So the quick answer is that I don't know. But one lesson from dualities, and I think there's an obvious lesson and a less obvious lesson. So the obvious lesson is that we are surprised by the fact that they exist. I think nobody is going to dispute that. Every time we see a new duality, we are surprised. Maybe we got used to it, but we're still surprised. So that's the obvious lesson. The less obvious lesson is, which is more personal, and many people disagree with that. 
I think the fact that we are surprised means that there's something very basic we don't understand. Because if we understood it, we would not be surprised. That was the question. So I do not know what it is that underlies that. I think this exploration of the defamation class of field theories is a step in this direction. This might be a step in the wrong direction, but it at least addresses some other questions. I okay. don't have any more wisdom yeah. to offer. Okay, and uh, a more practical-ish question is, what have we learned in the last 10 years about the real world UCD uh, with supersymmetric quantum field theories and what might we hope to learn in the next 10 years? So, what was it about supersymmetric? Using supersymmetric uh, quantum field theory, which is what have we learned about <coughs> QCD, real world QCD, and what can we learn in the next 10 years? So I think we have learned quite a lot with supersymmetry and without in from various different directions. I can start enumerating things. Of course, the things I worked on are closer to my heart and then the first to come to my mind, but there are many others that I did not work on. I was personally very interested in the physics as a function of theta, as we vary the theta parameter, but there have been many other uh, developments. Now, supersymmetry is in the same class, so somebody could ask why should we be interested in that? It's in the same class of thinking of models in fewer dimensions. Why are we interested in physics in fewer dimensions? Partly because they exist in the world, in the lab, but second, these are good laboratories for the real thing, and we learn lessons from that, and then we have to extract the lessons. What will we learn in the future? I'm sure I'll be surprised. Yeah, I think you're too modest to say that cyborg witten theory certainly gave us a explicit toy model of confined electromagnetic confinement. And ADS-CFT gave us another right. one, and I'm sure there will be many others. And Should we be worried that pure mathematicians still can't make rigorous sense out of any absolutely, quantum field theory? Absolutely. I think this is a very serious issue. And I don't think we should dismiss the, this question and say, oh, they don't, they don't make sense of it because they're not smart enough. That's not the case. They're very smart. I think it really, it's again another sign that there are big things that we're not understanding. Just as duality, I think, is a sign that there are big things we're not understanding. The same thing is true for the lack of rigor. And once it is rigorous, I'm sure that this will give us new insight. It will not be just dotting the I's and crossing the T's. These would be deep ways of thinking about a theory. I wish I, know, I knew what these would be. Uh, but this is for the younger people in the audience. There's really a lot to work on. And hopefully one of you, or maybe several of you, will solve this problem. Do, uh, do you or your uh, colleague uh, have any ideas how mathematicians would go about making QFT rigorous? I have no idea. Edward? <laughs> well, I, I, no wisdom to offer. I doubt that. Okay, let me uh, end by asking a question. So you carefully restricted yourself to the way we currently understand quantum field theory, uh, essentially as an effective field theory, if you want. Um, in the Wilsonian spirit. Um, you contrasted that, it's, which is roughly the same way can this matter people do, where, but they have a real cutoff and we don't. And we are very interested in what happens when you remove the cutoff. Now, I feel that quantum field theory is part of a much bigger framework, which is to be explored when we try to remove the cutoff or deform the theory in irrelevant deformations. And there are a few of those. You mentioned uh, non-commutative geometry. <coughs> also, <coughs> more <coughs> string theory, uh, and more recently, TT bar deformations and the like. Um, in the Wilsonian approach, Wilson Imagine the space of all quantum field theory. It's a totally uncontrollable space in anything but relevant uh, directions of deformation. Uh, 
So since this is a visionary speculative session, what do you think about, so quantum field theory is this great thing, the language of physics, but it clearly it's incomplete. And in the sense, in the Wilsonian sense, because we only can explore those deformations that are under control. And we know that there are many that are not under control. A much larger framework. What do you think of that framework, which includes string theory, of course? Well, I don't have anything useful to say except that I think it should be explored. And I think it would be very rewarding to explore it. Um, I wish I could say more. <laughs> Sorry? I wish I could say more, but uh, I have no idea how to explore it. But I think all these things, I had this slide from eight years ago, and that was mentioned there. This is a big gap in our understanding, and I think it really calls for, for an answer. Right. No, I, 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 w I was sure you would not have the answer, but uh, it's very important. The question is very important, especially since there are a lot of young people here, and that's one of the relatively unexplored niches of quantum field theory. So this is the slide that was there. Extend that was eight years ago. Right. A traditional local quantum field theory. So yeah. like the examples you gave. Right. Any uh, questions from the audience in response to the, specifically to the talk? Adam? An example of an anomaly that obviously is affected by turning on uh, changing things in the uh, short distances. There's something with the sound, I can't see Sorry, I, I haven't gotten the today. So take the central charge of a CFT. Move the microphone Move over. here, here? No, that would probably be better. I, it's, it's the uh, proximity between, you know, play with the distance. Okay, how about this? Is this better? All right, so the, the central charge of a CFT is not going to be preserved if I add something in the UV, um, because I could just add a massive scalar field in the UV and then go to a phase transition that becomes light. So that sort of thing is not the sort of anomaly you're talking about. Um, perhaps it comes under this exception in the, if you do it with a lattice that moves you, translation moves your lattice around. Um, can you give some insight into the difference between the sort of anomalies that you do expect to be preserved and the sort that you don't? I don't think I fully understand the question, but I, sorry? Yeah. Yeah, yeah vile anomalies, yeah, vile anomaly, and there are a bunch, of, so this was a little bit simplified here, but some of these anomalies do not fit the general picture. Uh, the vile anomaly is one of them, so I propose for the purpose of this talk, focus on the ordinary global symmetries and maybe the ordinary gravitational anomalies, not the conformal anomalies. And maybe somebody in the audience who has deeper understanding of anomalies could shed more light on this. I think the shortening anomaly I mentioned at the end also does not quite fit this general picture. Any other urgent questions? Okay, we'll have time at the end so you can continue to think about questions for Nadi. And we will, thank you, Nadi. Great talk.